Hey guys, my name is Scobie and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to play Nintendo DS games on your Xbox Series S or your Xbox Series X. This is going to be a nice, quick and easy tutorial. I'm going to be showing you step by step how to do everything. Let's jump right into this. So I will mention for this video, we're going to need to have both dev mode and RetroArch set up and installed on our Xbox Series S or Xbox Series X. That's not something I'm going to be showing you in today's video. I'm actually going to be leaving a link in the description down below and a card on screen to my previous video where I show you step by step how to do this. It's really easy. It shouldn't take too long. Once that's finished, you can come back over here and then I'm going to be showing you specifically how to play DS games on your Xbox. So we are also going to be needing an external drive to be able to bring our games over and play them directly from that. Currently, I have my Pokemon on heart gold in a dot rare file right here i will be mentioning i'm not going to be showing you in today's video how to download games although they are really easy to find a quick google search will help you out or you can feel free to create a dump or existing copy of games you already have i'm leaving some links in the description down below to help you out with this although i will not be sharing any game download links if you do download your games like i do right now your game will most likely come in a dot rare or a dot seven zip file Mine is currently in a rare format. And if it comes in a .rare or .7 zip file, you will need extra software to be able to extract it. So in this case, we're gonna be using either WinRare or 7-zip. I'll be leaving both of these linked in the description down below. At the moment, I'm using 7-zip and I'm gonna be showing you the process with that. Although the process with WinRare is very, very similar. So to extract our .rare file with 7-zip, what we need to do is select our file. We're gonna be hovering over 7-zip and we're gonna be extracting the files, which is gonna allow you to choose where you want to extract your files or extract here if you'd like to extract in your current location. For me, I'm gonna be clicking extract here and just extracting it in my current location and it's going to start to extract right away. Now depending on the size of your game and the computer you're using this can take a couple seconds to a couple minutes so you may have to be a little bit patient here and just like that your game will be extracted out. Now at the moment mine is extracted out into a .nds format and that's exactly where we're going to need to be able to open up and play inside RetroArch and NDS format is a Nintendo DS format game. So from this point what we're going to be doing is making sure this is currently on an external drive that we have access to. I've actually extracted everything already over to my iDrive and what we're going to be doing is is disconnecting this drive, bringing it over and plugging it into our Xbox. And then we're gonna be continuing from there and setting everything up inside RetroArch. Now, if this is your first time connecting this external drive, it might ask if you wanna use it as game storage or if you wanna use it as media storage. You need to make sure that you select media storage here. If you select Xbox game storage, it will wipe everything and only allow you to install Xbox games. Whereas with media storage, we can put any type of files on here we want. So it's really important that you select media storage. Once you have that set up, what we're gonna be doing is loading up RetroArch. You can either do it from this menu here or you can feel free to launch it to home and run it directly from there. So once you're in RetroArch, what we're going to be doing is coming to our main menu, as you can see I'm on right now. We're going to be clicking down one until we get to the load content option. And we're going to be clicking the A button to select this open. Now from this point, your drive will most likely show up in your E drive. However, I currently have my hard drive partitioned. So for me, it shows up between my E and my F drive and all of my content is currently on my F drive. However, for you, it will most likely be on your E drive unless you have your drive partitioned like me. So I'm going to be coming down to my F drive. I'm going to be coming to my Xbox folder. I'm going to be coming to my ROM folder. I'm going to be looking for my Nintendo DS ROMs. And as you can see, my .nds file shows up right here. And as mentioned earlier, when extracting our games, you can't play games directly from a .rar or .7zip, or only sometimes you can do that. It typically gives issues. So that's exactly why we needed to extract it to show up in a .nds format. Once we're at this point, we simply need to click A to select our game again. And from this point, we will have to select the core. Now with Nintendo DS, there's currently three cores you can use. Desmoom 2015, Desmoom, and Melon DS. For today's video, I'm going to be using Desmoom 2015. However, you can feel free to experiment and play around with the different cores depending on what your needs are and just see which one gives you the best performance depending on the game you're playing. It's always worth experimenting with these. So what I'm going to be doing is simply selecting Desmoom 2015 and then our core is going to start to load up. Now this can take a couple of seconds depending on how big your game is. So just be a little bit patient here until your game loads up. And just like that, my game is loading up. Now one nice thing about this core is it does actually keep the original aspect ratio so nothing is going to be stretched to fill and that's a really, really good thing. And you can see even as I start to play here, the overall experience and frame rate actually feels really good and overall it actually works really well. Now if at any point you'd like to bring up your menu for me it's down in select you can feel free to enter the combination key for this. What I'm going to be doing is scrolling down here until we see the options tab and we're going to be looking at a couple of options for our core. Now this is one of the cores where you do have quite a few options. At the top here we just have our game file options. Below this we then have our internal resolution. This will require a restart to come into effect however we do have a couple of options here. 256 by 192 is the default. However you can feel free to experiment here and scale up. However I typically leave it at the native resolution 
resolution, but you can feel free to try out the different resolutions here and see how it handles with the game you're trying to play. Below this, we then have CPU cores. By default, this is set to one. Again, you can experiment with the different ones. For me, one core seemed to run just fine with this. However, if you are bumping up the internal resolution, you might want to increase the number of cores to help offset the load a little bit. The CPU mode is on the JIT. You also have the option for interpreter. Again, by default, I would recommend leaving it on JIT and only experiment when you're playing around with it. And then again, below this, we'll have the JIT block size. This isn't something I've experimented with at all. I've left it at the default 12, and that's something I definitely recommend. We then have the screen layout. So by default, as shown, it is top and bottom. However, you can feel free to show bottom top. So to switch your screens around, left, right, right, left, top only, bottom only, quick switch, hybrid top and hybrid bottom. So you do have quite a lot of options here. For me, I actually prefer the left, right orientation. It's the best one for me. However, you can feel free to experiment and choose exactly what you want. We're then going to be talking about the pointer and how to actually set it up so you can set up the pointer on screen. You need to make sure your enable mouse and pointer is set up. We're going to be making sure our pointer type is to mouse. We can set up the mouse speed. Again, I'd recommend leaving it at one. You can feel free to experiment around with this if you would like. We can set up a pointer color. This is a really nice option depending on the games you're playing. I would recommend either leaving it black or white. For today's video, I'm just going to be using black. And two extra things you need to remember to set up are the pointer mode, eye analog. We're going to be setting it from none to emulated. And then we're going to be doing it the same with the right analog. We're going to be setting it for none to emulated. So with this, you can use either your left or your right analog stick on your controller to actually move around our pointer emulator. I will be showing you that after we go through the rest of the settings. We have emulated pointer dead zone percent, emulated pointer acceleration modifier. For all three of these, I'd recommend leaving them by default. I typically don't recommend experimenting with the dead zone and acceleration modes unless you're having some really specific issues with your pointer. However, for me, I actually didn't have any issues and I imagine for most people, it will also be fine. We can emulate stylus jitter. This is a nice option. However, I would recommend leaving this off as well. Load game into memory, which will require a restart. I'm going to be leaving this off by default. However, this can decrease loading speed times a little bit, so this can be a nice option. However, turning it off, I didn't have any issues. The games are pretty small. There are quite a few settings with this core, and depending on what you're trying to do, you can really feel free to experiment around with them. I've already experimented with the high level settings in this core. However, if you want to experiment with the nitty gritty, you can feel free to do this. For me, the most valuable things were the internal resolution and the actual stylus pointer on screen. Everything else was secondary as everything else worked really well. Now, so we set up our stylus before. You can see as I move around my joystick, you can see it on the right screen right here. This small little stylus pointer. Now, by default, it is set to one speed, so you might want to turn that down depending on what you're trying to do. You can feel free to come down here. If I press RT on my controller, it will actually push this forward. Of course, you can change this in your settings as well if you would like. However, overall, for me, it works really, really well. Now, one last thing I would recommend doing is setting up a game playlist. As you can see right now, I currently have one set up for the SNES. It's basically going to concatenate all of your games in a single folder and just lay them out in a nice little setup like this. It will even add the cartridge to the left, which I think is a really nice touch. The great thing about this is we can automatically attach and assign a core to this, and it will make it a lot easier to locate to your Nintendo DS games without having to go manually search every time. So it's definitely something I'd recommend doing and checking out. It'll help save you a lot of time and makes your overall RetroArch experience a lot better. Anyway, guys, it's as easy as that to play Nintendo DS games on your Xbox Series S or your Xbox Series X. If you guys enjoyed this tutorial, be sure to drop a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out the other videos on the channel. I'm going to be leaving a link down below to my PayPal if you found these videos helpful and you want to support me. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, as always, keep it saucy. Peace.